already sort of touched on this, but could you tell us a bit more about your work at Prudential? Um, so there's 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 a couple of, um, so there's, there's a couple of things. The uh, there's the work that I enjoy, uh, and that there is uh, the work that is necessary to be able to do the work that I enjoy. And the work that I enjoy is uh, doing this kind of stuff, which is great. Um, and then there are sort of various levels of, sort of things that need to be done um, that to to get the freedom to do this. Uh, because quite frankly, um, you know, reality is that 99% of my colleagues don't want to A, do anything at all, um, apart from turning up at 9 o'clock in the morning and leaving at 5 o'clock in the evening and kind of get paid in between. Um, Are any of Michael's colleagues here right now? <laughs> I hope not. Only the good ones. Um, no, uh, oh, the, the, the 1%. Um, no, um, and, and if, they, if they do stuff, they certainly don't want to change. You know, um, how, many, um, how many insurance employees does it take to change a light bulb? Change? What do you mean change? Um, so um, so you, you need to find a way to get them to accept that there is a different way of doing the kind of stuff that they've been doing. Um, and that may be faster, better, cheaper, and leading to better outcomes, not just for us as an organization, but more importantly for our customers. So there's a lot of convincing, and the convincing has different kind of levels. There's damn meetings and calls, and talking to people, and communicating with them, and listening to them, and hearing their uh, concerns and reservations, but also proving that this works. And the hothouses that I mentioned, you know, building small prototypes, and gradually ramping up on the maturity level uh, is, is one thing. So you know, a lot of the stuff that I, I need to do is quite frankly tedious, um, and, but it, is a, it serves the purpose of being able to do the cool stuff. And so what got you to, to here, uh, where you are now? Um, you know, what, what led you to start your work in AI and, and more specifically in FinTech? Um, um, so I, I'm a I'm a theoretical physicist by training, um, uh, t totally deterministic. Um, um, became an operational research sort of consultants, building econometric models in the in the 90s. Um, again, <laughs> totally deterministic. But then over time, there's a couple of things that happened. And the famous things are obviously the data sets got bigger, but also people were asking more interesting questions, and they wanted to ask the, those questions from sort of more complex data structures involving first, not just numbers, but text, and then obviously you know, all this kind of audio stuff came out, and uh, there's a whole bunch of tools that emerged among that. And over time, you know, people also wanted to have real-time uh, responses rather than just historic analyses of what, what, how good the world would have been if we'd done something completely different. So, um, you know, and then the, the, big, the big change, so there was a realization over time that this is probably no longer econometrics. The big change came in 2007, or for me, probably in early 2008, after Hadoop came out. Uh, and then I called myself proudly a data scientist, uh, which I, I kind of guess I still am. But then, really, the realization was that what I'm doing was, again, um, a whole bunch of nonsense. Because all I built was more sophisticated models that nobody ever wanted to use to do anything. Um, you know, I, I spent 20 years building amazing models that nobody used. Um, it's not quite as drastic as that, but that's kind of how it, how it works. So uh, then I realized, damn it, it's because none of these models are in production anywhere, and they don't have a feedback loop that allow me to improve the models. And over time, I then at some point over the last, whatever it is, five years, I realized actually that's kind of what these AI crazies are talking about. Then obviously deep learning came out, which I was a total objector to. Um, for many years, uh, for two years or something like that, after, uh, after I first heard about it. Because I thought it was great if you're Google uh, or Facebook and you have billions of images that are automatically tagged by users, but it's no good for anybody else. And then I had sort of a, a realization, sort of a, sort of, um, is it Paul to Damascus kind of conversion uh, in 2014 where I did a, a, a piece of work for a car maker where 
deep learning was the only way to get something to work that I tried to get to work. And if you're interested, I can, I'm happy to tell you about it. It was kind of cool. But um, yeah, and since then, big f fan of deep learning. Okay. Uh, what sort of challenges are you currently facing in your work and how is deep learning you know, helping you address them? Um, I think, so there's this, it kind of goes back to the question of the gentleman here. You know, there's, there's, there's some challenges that are more sort of technical. It comes back to instrumentation and having the right tool sets. And we, we not just do we love forms, but we love security. And security is a great reason to not let you do anything, or let, not let you do anything interesting, apart from copy-pasting stuff in Excel, uh, which seems to be the pinnacle of uh, number crunching for, uh, let's not be too insulting. Um, so, so, so getting to so the instrumentation stuff, having data that is actually meaningful and uh, that allows us to do the kind of things that we want to do without with the kind of packages that we want to use and with kind of a Python shop, quite frankly. Um, and that was a bit of a revelation to, um, to, to my security colleagues that, yes, we do want to download this stuff from the internet. Uh, that that's kind of looks dangerous uh, and it's code written by other people and you know, lots of people are trusting it, so why, why, why don't we? Um, but I think what's more interesting is actually the cultural challenges. Uh, and the cultural challenges are much more along the lines of, you know, this is all just uh, the latest fad, this is hocus pocus, is this something that drives value for our business or is it just something that keeps some uh, fancy, expensive people in continuous employment? Um, but so it, it's this gradual realization. I don't even remember what your question was. Uh, sorry, um, I just keep babbling. So we may better ask a, ask a new question. Okay. Um, how do you see deep learning transforming the sort of wider financial services industry? I mean, could it transform the wider sector? I think it already is to a certain extent, but it's one of those things where. There's, I think there's two aspects. I think it's as a tool, it's tremendously powerful, but as all tools, it's easily misused and used sometimes in the wrong places. But if you see a great craftsman use the tool for the right purpose, there's some beautiful stuff coming out of it. And the other thing is that this is an, obviously an area that, that keeps on evolving and ever faster so. So um, I don't know what's, what's next. Uh, I will read this year as over the last years with great interest what comes out of NIPS and um, see where, where this is going. And there's people who are talking about the, uh, the revenge of the Bayesians and all these kind of things. So let, let, let's see. But uh, at the moment, I think deep learning is an amazing, uh, an, an amazing tool that, that, will, that will certainly be able to achieve a lot, a lot for us that was up until now unimaginable. And what I mean by unimaginable, it, it's, I know it sounds sort of hyperbolic, and sort of, uh, but the, the truth is, you know, I, I didn't talk about it uh, um, uh, really, but the, the audio search piece that I mentioned before, you know, where we're listening to, so we have one regulatory program, and I shouldn't you know, do much about it, because otherwise regul compliance people slap me again. Uh, but yeah, there's one program where we have to listen to literally hundreds of thousands of hours of phone calls you know, half a million hours of phone calls, roughly. And um, my um, esteemed colleagues, the first reaction that they had when they were faced with that was to go to London's most highly paid consultants and say, and said, can you give us a couple of hundred people to, um, to listen to those calls? And of course, everybody said, yippee, yes, let us... Uh, give us all these people on, on, our, on our bench and we charge them out for a long time at a high rate to you. It didn't, hadn't occurred to them that there would be an opportunity to listen to those calls automatically. And the truth is, of course, that all this stuff is really messy. You know, and not to be uh, too disrespectful to people in the room. I think I'm, is Nikita in the room? Uh, our call, good, she's not in. Uh, our call center is in Scotland, our UK call center is in Scotland, and our customer base tends to be on the older end of the age spectrum. So um, listening to those phone calls is somewhere in between amusing and absolutely bewildering. 
Um, so um, you know, to to then say that you have an algorithm that leads that, that listens to that and have some kind of level of accuracy coming out of it is um, kind of a, a tall statement. But actually, what we did was we built two completely different kind of orthogonal approaches to listening to those calls. If you're interested, in one based on phonetic search, one on sort of brute force transcription, and we combine those two, and that managed to get us to the kind of accuracy levels that we're now uh, are now achieving, and to that high level of automation. So um, for for most of my colleagues, that that's kind of comes close to magic, uh, and, I, and I think that's that's what we the interesting thing that we get out of these kind of approaches is not some kind of incremental improvement of some existing business process, but some radical change, that some really step change, step changes in the way we do business. And that, that's why I'm really exciting, I'm excited about these kind of tools and techniques. Hmm. So one area that you know, some people are concerned about within this field is ethics. Um, what, do you think sort of what do you think the best, sort of best practices around this? Um, So it's, I, I, I tell you what we should have. What we should have is well-established frameworks and guidelines of how to behave and what to do and how to check things and how to check for bias in models, for instance. Um, don't quote me on that. I don't think we have those. I actually, I, I know we don't have those yet. <laughs> Um, but um, I think it's probably more a question of time rather than anything else. Okay. Cool. And the growth of AI has been exponential, as you said yourself. Um, you know, what, what do you think the key skills are for a career in this field? You know, with more and more you know sectors now sort of adopting these these techniques. Um, the key, I don't know. The key skill uh, having a um, having a curiosity about um, doing cool stuff with data using machine learning. And uh, I, th I think we now live in a world where you, know, you don't have to, you know, I, I think you can even have flunked your undergrad, undergraduate linear algebra these days uh, and still have a good career in this field uh, because the, the widespread availability of tried and tested packages. And of course, it comes back to you know, knowing your tool and knowing how to use your tool. There is something to that. But the truth is that now, uh, you know, I think the, the barrier to entry has been lowered drastically, which is kind of scary for us to a certain extent, because we're in this field already and there's maybe a lot more people who will come into it. But actually, it's very exciting because what we see is this incredible democratization of kind of the tools and the approaches and therefore also the requirements on capabilities has really been lowered. So I think the main important thing, the most important thing is um, you know, some endurance with the maths on, uh, on working through getting to an understanding of machine learning, but mainly curiosity and an ability to code okay. and stay away from graphical user interfaces. <laughs> so if we were sitting here again in five years' time, uh, what industries would you hope would have you know, adopt, adopted AI and which ones do you expect will have? I actually expect all of them to have adopted it in some way. Uh, and for us all to, for AI, for AI to be as exciting, well, maybe not in five years, but certainly in 10 years. So let me go, go to the extreme first, if I may. You know, in 10 years, I think AI, AI will be exciting to, as exciting to people as electricity is to us today. You know, okay, you, you walk into a room and the lights come on. You don't even have to flick the switch anymore. And ex exactly the same will happen to AI. It will be an obvious part of our business processes, and you wouldn't Run a bit, you wouldn't want to run a business without AI. You know, what else are you going to run it on? Buggy humans who sometimes get out of, on the, get out of bed on the wrong side and all these kind of things. Um, no, humans are good. They need to train our algorithms. I like humans. Um, no, um, the, so, um, but I, I think by, th that's definitely on the journey. In five years, I think we will be on, somewhere on the journey to that. The total, this will be totally normal. And the only question is, so what's the next revolution? And what, what, what will get us excited in five years from now? Which obviously I have no idea, but I'd be excited to find out. Hmm. Any predictions? No. Right. <laughs> <laughs> predictions are uh, very hard, especially about the future. Okay. So no, I'll stay away from them.
Cool. <laughs> right, well, thank you very much. Thank you. It's been very, very informative. Thank, thank you. you.